Good evening, everyone. Welcome. It is Wednesday on Tuesday for Thanksgiving week here at Ridgewood Baptist Church. Thank you for joining me tonight. We are going to be having an incredible Bible study tonight as we continue our study looking at the 12 disciples. Tonight, we look at the disciple Thomas. So excited to be able to dive into that. When you get in and get on, please go ahead and let us know who all is here. Say hello to us. And then we truly want to get you to hit the share button as we send this message out, send the gospel out as far as we possibly can. So right now, go ahead and just say hello real quick. Put it in the comments. And then we want to encourage you to hit that share button and be a part of the ministry here at Ridgewood Baptist Church. I have got a very large list of prayer requests tonight that I want to go over. And so I want to give everybody the opportunity to get in and get on, and then we're going to cover the uh, prayer request, and then we will move on. Uh, Teresa Young has just posted uh, several prayer requests, and I have those. And so that'll say, if you saw that, uh, I have it, and I'll be sharing that in just a minute. Uh, if you have others that you would like to put on the list, make sure right now that you put it uh, in the comment section so that we'll have uh, a record of those prayer requests and we can keep up with that. So any prayer request right now, go ahead and uh, get those uh, in here to me. And then we'll be sharing that with our church family. And then uh, uh, here shortly, we will be diving into uh, the, the character study of Thomas. I will go ahead and tell you now, go ahead and turn over in your Bibles to John chapter 11. That's where we're going to be camped out at, John chapter 11. I'm trying to share right now myself, and so this will give us just a couple more seconds to do that. While we are in this waiting process and trying to get everybody shared, I want to go ahead and tell you now, we've got a line of storms that's coming through in the state. They're already in Arkansas right now. So I want you to be careful tonight, okay? There is going to be uh, some storms that's going to come through our area. I'm not real sure how severe, but there is storms going to come through tonight. And then there is going to be a pretty large patch of storms that's going to come through in the morning, somewhere in that six to seven o'clock hour. So uh, I just, I want you folks just to be, be careful, okay? If you've got to get out, go to work, you've got to go shop, whatever the case may be. Uh, I want you to just be careful, all right? Make sure that you dress appropriately and uh, don't get caught out in a downpour. All right, I'm almost done. That'll take care of that. That is my last one. Okay, I have got everything up, set up, ready to go. And that way now I can get in and see who all is hanging out with me. All right, there's my bride. Miss Denise is here with me. There's Mary Weddington. There is Jack and Sandy. Hi, folks. How are y'all doing up at the Grand Metropolis of Colt, Arkansas? Uh, Miss Jessie, hi, lady. How are you tonight? Glad to see you. There's Tommy and Arlene Allen from Marianne. Glad you folks are here. Uh, again, when you get in, go ahead and say hello. Hit the share button. Okay, it's critical you hit the share button. That's just being a part of the Ridgewood Broadcast Ministry. Uh, there's Dan and Bev. Glad to see you guys coming in. Jesse says, I'm coming to your house. Sweet lady, you come on and we'll ride the cows out back. Okay, you just come on over. Uh, we are going to have a good old time. We got cows, horses, and there's a donkey out there somewhere. So I, I believe I can find that donkey just for you, Jesse. Uh, so we'll be all good to go. But uh, again, please be careful. There's storms coming in. There's Denny. Miss Denny. What's going on, girl? Hey, how was your day? Seven. How was your day? I know you were in and out. Uh, folks, we've had a couple of really, really good uh, uh, coffee chats in the morning. And so uh, we just had a whole lot of fun. And uh, if you've missed them, make sure you get back over there, take a look at them. We've talked a lot about giving. We've talked about tithing and what it looks like in Scripture. And so I want to make sure you uh, you take a look at that. Let's see what Scripture says and see where we are. All right, we are rolling on. Got some folks still uh, beginning to come on in and say hello. Uh, when you're here, please say howdy. We want to know that you were here so we can kind of uh, engage back and forth and uh, can chit chat. Um, tomorrow, uh, Miss Gloria will not be in the office. I will. And so if you need anything, you can call the office in the morning, 633-1121. And then uh, after we leave tomorrow afternoon, then the office will be closed until uh, services on Sunday morning. Uh, but I will be in town. So if you need anything, you can give me a call on my cell and uh, you can reach me here right on Facebook. And uh, if you need me, please make sure that uh, you let me know. Okay, uh, like I said, I will be here in uh, in town. As a matter of fact, I'm not even thinking that Denise and I are planning on even leaving the county. So uh, we'll be right here uh, in case that uh, that you folks need us. Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started with our prayer request tonight. Like I said, we have a lot, 
And so uh, uh, if you are writing them down, okay, uh, uh, good luck. And if not, then uh, just you can call me later or I can message them to you. It's, it's whatever the case may be. Most of these are going to be posted somewhere already, especially on our private group page for our church. Uh, Teresa Young posted several a while ago, and I want to make sure that we cover those because there's just a lot and there's some uh, very serious uh, needs, okay, for prayer. Jeff Young's uncle uh, has tested positive uh, for the virus, and not only his uncle, but his uncle's son is also positive. So we've got, got the virus now rolling in that family. Uh, Teresa also shared with us that Brother Carl Weatherford is also positive. Uh, evidently, this is found out today. I'm not 100% sure when, but uh, evidently it is today. But Brother Carl is positive, and uh, there's a great chance that Marianne is as well. So uh, we want to continue to pray for Carl, uh, uh, his wife, uh, pray for the church, okay? Because that will uh, alter services at Ridgeview uh, for the next, next coming couple of weeks. So we want to pray for that family. Also, Teresa Young's son, uh, and I don't know his name, I'm sorry, you, most of you probably do, but Teresa's son was in an accident yesterday morning and he had to be rushed to the med in Memphis. He was okay enough for Teresa to pick him up last night and to bring him home. So he is out of the hospital, but evidently there was some, you know, some problems to keep him there overnight. So uh, we, we want to continue to remember her son. Also, a lady that Teresa works with there at uh, the, the dental office in Wynn, the lady's name is Tanya Smith. Now, some of you may know her if you live in Wynn. You may know her. Her name is Tanya Smith, works with Teresa at uh, Weatherford's dental, dental office. She ran off the road last night and she hit a guardrail and she currently has crushed vertebrae in her lower back. Uh, they are planning on doing the first of two surgeries tomorrow morning. She is currently in the ICU at the med in Memphis. Uh, and she also has, Teresa shared with us that she has a four-year-old son. So a lot of, of really, really serious prayer needs okay, that are going on right there with Teresa. Pray for Teresa, okay, and pray for Jeff as this is affecting their family. And so uh, uh, if you would, let's, let's lift up the young family and lift up these requests that Teresa uh, and Jeff has, have shared with us tonight. Uh, we also want to lift up uh, our sweet Miss Judy Davis. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, Miss Judy fell just a few days ago. And when she did, she broke, uh, I talked to her today, she broke three bones in her foot, uh, I, she says her leg, so I'm thinking it's the lower leg, part of that ankle area. I'm, I'm not going to be specific, and it doesn't matter. There's three broke bones, and uh, she is scheduled for surgery Monday at Campbell Clinic. And so, folks, she's in a lot of pain. She's you know, unable to get around. Uh, they do not have it in a cast. And so uh, we want to remember Miss Judy uh, uh, during this time. And so we, we really want to ask God just to just wrap his arms around her, just take this pain away and Lord, just to heal, heal these, these legs for her. So if you'll remember Miss Judy, uh, we want to continue to remember JD Sharp and Dina Smith and, and their family, uh, Dina's sister, Shannon from Mariana, uh, and the loss of Miss Bobby last week. So let's continue to remember them. I, uh, I talked with Johnny yesterday. They are doing okay uh, John and Dean are still working from home and uh, still trying to be, be safe and to be cautious. And uh, as of yesterday morning, J.D.'s brother is in and staying with him this week to uh, uh, you know, take care of him and to, to uh, be that, uh, that, that caregiver for J.D. Uh, also, I've got some very close friends of mine that uh, I shared with you on Sunday morning have tested positive for the virus. Uh, the pastor of First Baptist West Memphis. Uh, is positive and he and his entire staff are in quarantine right now. I've not talked to him uh, since then and so I don't know if any more of his staff is positive but uh, I will do that tomorrow and see what all is going on but first West Memphis. Also we want to pray for Calvary Baptist Church in West Memphis. Uh, the pastor, his wife, the, uh, the, the other staff members and their wives are all positive. Uh, there's uh, many more in their church. They had to completely cancel all services this past weekend. Their uh, worship and youth pastor 
uh, was hospitalized uh, for three or four days. And uh, I've just found out just within the past hour that he has been dismissed late this afternoon. So uh, that is a blessing, but uh, still want to pray for that church uh, as well. So two churches in, in the West Memphis area are struggling uh, with the virus. Uh, many of you know Brother David Young. Uh, Brother David is the pastor of Grace Baptist in West Memphis, and Brother David fell um, uh, sometime prior to Sunday, early in the weekend, and so he was unable to even preach on Sunday. Uh, I don't know the severity. I've not been able to get a hold of him, um, and, and so just remember Brother David and his family uh, and with whatever circumstances are uh, are currently going on. Um, I do know that uh, uh, Union Avenue in Wynn uh, has uh, had some strong issues with the virus. They have abbreviated their services for the rest of the year. Uh, I'm not real sure exactly what, but I know that it has been abbreviated. Um, I do know that Barton Chapel uh, out uh, from Earl, the one toward Tyronza, they are uh, they've dismissed all in-person. Uh, services through the end of this month, and they are going to reevaluate it uh, sometime next week to see what they want to look like going into December. So, uh, folks, this virus is here. It is real. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, we're, we're not playing games with this, okay? And so, uh, we want to be careful. We want to be safe. Uh, when you come on campus on Sunday, please wear your mask, okay? Please wear your mask. Um, again, this is not mandatory. This is just your pastor asking you to do this, all right? Um, please uh, be careful with social distancing. Um, uh, unless you're in the family unit, we want to be careful. Uh, we are doing uh, so much trying to make sure that we keep our uh, uh, church complex clean and sanitized, and so uh, you are safe there. Our children's area where we've got our nursery and our children's church, it's, it's all clean, it's, it's sanitized, and so you have no worries at that point. We're just asking each one of us just to, let's just do our part, okay? Not only protect uh, ourselves, let's protect others from what might arise. All right, so uh, if there's any more prayer requests, uh, please go ahead and get those out here to us so that we can share. I know that is a lot, and uh, uh, you know something? I'm a believer in prayer. I believe that God answers prayers, and so uh, what I want you to do is just to make sure that you commit to praying for these with me as we move forward, because I believe that God has a plan. He has a purpose, uh, whether it's for these wrecks, whether it is for the folks that have tested positive, whether it's for the virus, it just doesn't matter. I believe that God has a plan and I believe that God has a purpose. And so uh, if you will do that, I would so, so greatly appreciate that. I, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pray for us tonight. I'm going to pray for these requests and I'll ask you to do the same. And then we are headed to John's Gospel chapter 11 and we have got some incredible stuff that we're going to talk about tonight as we look at this character study on the disciple Thomas. Will you pray with me this afternoon? Father, I, I uh, Lord, I just come to you tonight with a heavy heart Father, there's just so much that's going on in our lives. And Father, right now, I just specifically lift up Teresa and Jeff Young and their family to you. Father, there's just so many little things. It just seems like it, it, it's hitting that precious family from every angle. And God, I just pray that you will just put a hedge of protection around Jeff and Teresa and Billy. Lord, that you will just not allow any of this mess to get any closer to them that's going on. God, you'll be with Teresa's son. Father, that you will be with Teresa's co-worker, uh, with all the doctors and the surgery. Father, for these, these pastors and their families that have tested positive and are having to quarantine and to, to be away from their church and their church families, Father, I just I lift them all to you. God, we know that, that there's something going on. We know that you're in charge. And Father, we just want to be still and to hear what you're doing, to see what you're doing. And Father, just join you at work. Father, I lift up Miss Judy to you tonight. And God, I know that this, this precious lady's in pain. And Father, I just pray that you will just wrap your arms around that leg, Father, and just take the pain away. Let her sleep tonight. God, let her relax. And Father, that you would just hold her close, Lord, until she gets to that doctor this, this coming week. And Lord, work through those doctors and those nurses. And God, just do a tremendous work there. God, I just uh, I want to continue to remember JD and Dina and Shannon and their their family, Lord, as as they they've lost Miss Bobby. 
Father, they're adjusting, they're grieving. And Father, I just uh, I just ask you, Lord, that you would just shine through the darkness, Lord, and let them see you. Lord, they would feel your, your love, they'd feel your comfort. And Lord, they would just follow your guidance in the direction that you have them going in. Father, I pray for my brother Clint Haynes tonight, who is traveling, he and his family are out of state for the holidays. I pray you will just give them a precious time with family. And Lord, that you will bring them home safely this weekend. God, I pray for my family. I thank you, Lord, for watching out and protecting us. I pray that you will continue to keep our kids safe in Texas. God, I pray that you will just wrap your arms around them, protect my son-in-law, Lord, as he's in the public day in and day out. God, we just know that you are, do are doing a mighty work in our families. We know that you're doing a work right here in the Delta. And God, I just pray Lord, I pray again tonight, I don't want to be remiss and I don't want to be redundant, but Father, I know that you're wanting to just to send revival right here to us. And God, we got to get ready. We got to, to, to do our part that you're calling us to. God, I pray for revival to break loose here in the Delta tonight. God, I pray that souls will be drawn to you and that they would give their lives to you this night all over this, this Delta region. Father, as we look at one of those 12 guys that you handpicked. Father, I pray that we see this man in a complete different light tonight. And Father, that we hear from you and that we see this man's heart. Father, I love you. I thank you. For those requests that have not been made known, God, I pray that you hear those also. Father, hide me behind the cross tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Uh, lots and lots of things going on. Let me see here. A sister and mom tested positive to COVID after I returned. Uh, it's Wanda Arnold. Ken is negative. She is negative. Praise the Lord. All of them is okay. All those mentioned. Okay, very good. Thank you for sharing that, Wanda. We greatly, greatly appreciate that as well. Thank you for sharing. We just, uh, you know, all this stuff is nasty. I mean, it is just, uh, it is, it is just nasty. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and tell you now, I'm going to move fairly quickly tonight because we've got a lot of stuff I want to cover. Uh, there's just so much good stuff on this this man called Thomas, and uh, I don't want us to miss out on anything. If you have comments, if you have questions, make sure you go ahead and send them in. Remember, we are delayed. There's about a 20-second delay from yeah. what uh, I say to what you hear, and I, I do understand that. And so... Uh, uh, whatever questions you have, we will do our best to get to that. Uh, make sure you like the comments you want to or uh, hit that heart button, that care button, and make sure that you hit the share button so that we can get this message out to your friends and to your families. Okay, we're talking about Thomas. Okay, Thomas is the man. Uh, if I were to ask you what do we know about Thomas, the one thing that we're going to come right back and say, well, that's doubting Thomas, okay? He is the doubter. And so what I, I, I want you to, to know is that that is the primary identifier for him, but it may not necessarily be true, okay? Because I think tonight we're going to peel back a few layers, and I think we're going to see something that we may have been missed all these years. Uh, first, let me just share with you, Thomas is the final disciple, or he's number eight, in the list of disciples. In other words, he is the last in the second group of four. You know, we've broken the disciples down into three groups of four. Well, he is the final one in group two. So that kind of gets us uh, uh, a little bit ahead as to where we are. And remember, as I shared earlier, the more we go, the less we know. And uh, so we just want to uh, you know, un understand that. I do want us to understand that this man is going to be a little bit of a better man than what we've realized all these years. Um, I think it's safe to say when we talk about Thomas, when we talk about doubting Thomas, that uh, he was somewhat of a negative person. He, was, uh, he always saw the glass half empty. Um, he was a worry war. He was a brooder. He tended to be anxious about everything. I give this description to him, and I think you're going to understand it, especially those of you who have had kids or, or grandkids and, and, and you've, you've seen cartoons. You remember the cartoon characters of Winnie the Pooh and Piglet and Eeyore? And Eeyore was the sad little donkey who, who uh, he always saw the negative side of things. He always anticipated the worst all the time. Well, Thomas was a modern-day Eeyore, just to be real honest with you. He always saw the worst. Uh, never could see the positive. It was always the negative. And so well, the word we want to give him is pessimist. 
pessimism. Pessimism rather than doubt was his primary problem. And I think we're going to see that as we move through the, the, the scriptures tonight. And so what I want you to do right now is, as we continue, as we dive a little deeper, is I'd like to remove the, 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 the tag of doubter, okay? The doubter. Instead of Thomas the doubter, all right, let's try to look at him as Thomas the pessimist, okay? Thomas the pessimist. I want to read John 11, verse 16 tonight, but I want to read it in the original King James text. Okay, because there's something here in the text that we, we, we want to identify here in King James. And then I'm going to get back over to my primary translation, which is the new King James. But in the King James translation, John 11, 16, it reads like this. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, that's D-I-D-Y-M-U-S, called Didymus. And that is a name, okay? Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples... Let us also go that we may die with him. Okay, Didymus means the twin, the twin. And we see that when we look at different translations. For example, I'm going to read this now in the New King James, and it says this. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So apparently Thomas had a twin brother or a twin sister. We don't know which one, and we don't even know their names because they are never, ever identified in Scripture. But he is known as Thomas the twin. And so I think it's very ironic when we see this and we see these, the, you know, we see that he has a twin. And when I had encountered twins or triplets uh, in my life, and I'm sure you, you have seen some too, they have very similar characteristics. And a lot of times they have the same personalities. And so I would have to wonder, does Thomas or did Thomas's twin share the same pessimistic views of life? Or was the twin the flip of that and the more optimistic side of that? So just something to think about, you know, as you're processing scripture throughout the day. But he was a twin to someone in the New Testament. Now, like Nathaniel was, Thomas is only mentioned once in the, the three synoptic gospels. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you only find Thomas's name one time. And in each of those times, it is when they are listing the 12 disciples. And we've gone over these lists. It's listed in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then it's listed in Acts. And so only, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, only hit him up when, boom, there he is, bullet point, there's Thomas, he's number eight, boom. Okay, that's all we get. Everything we know about the man is going to be found in the Gospel of John, which is going to make for an interesting twist a little bit later on. And so I want to hold on to that thought, and I'll come back to it later. But remember, he's only found where? in the Gospel of John. Okay, now, as, as I've already mentioned, Thomas was way more of a pessimist than he was a, a doubter. So as we go forward, let's try to see him in that light. Um, when, uh, when, when we read John, it's obvious that Thomas had the, the tendency to look into the darkest corners of life, okay? Uh, he seemed to always anticipate the worst of everything, but in spite of his pessimism, there are some pretty cool elements of his character that comes through. Now, here in John eleven sixteen, we're going to read it again, okay? Even though it's one single verse, all right? It talks so much. I mean, there's just volumes, if you will, about his real character. Okay, let's read it again. Then Thomas, who had called the twin, or Didymus, he said to his fellow disciples, now remember, he's talking to the disciples. He says, let us also go that we may die with him, him being Jesus. All right, I want to set this up. When we get to this verse, John is basically describing the prelude to the right to the raising rather of Lazarus. Now, back in chapter ten, back in chapter ten here in John's Gospel, Jesus had left Jerusalem because his life was in jeopardy there. John ten forty tells us that he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. Okay, so great crowds, great multitudes of people, you know, came out of nowhere to hear Jesus preach. And scriptures teach that many people believed in him. And in all honesty, 
just something to kind of put in the back of your noggin here as we're, as we're moving through here. In all honesty, this, this time period may have been the most successful time of ministry that the disciples had witnessed in all of the time that they spent had been hanging around Jesus. Okay, During this time period, all right, the people are extremely responsive, souls are being converted, and Jesus is able to minister freely without the opposition Excuse me, of the religious leaders uh, there in Jerusalem, they're just giving him fits. So time is good, okay? I mean, it's it's great. It's where you want to be. It's it's everything is in place. The pieces of the puzzle have fit together, and the disciples know that, and they're being able to bask in that uh, for for this time, okay? But something happened to interrupt their time in the wilderness. So chapter 11 begins, okay, it begins with the, the death of Lazarus. Okay, now we've looked just, just real recently here in the past few days, uh, or past couple of weeks rather, at the story of Lazarus and his sisters. Okay, in specific, we looked at the viewpoints of Mary and Martha. So we've covered this text from that angle. But tonight I want to take a different look at that situation as we're bringing in now Thomas's view into this whole thing. The, uh, the whole dilemma with, with Lazarus, in all honesty, pre uh, it, it presented as a, a kind of a, of a quandary. If Jesus had went that close, go, to go back that close to Jerusalem, then basically he's walking back into the depths of hostility. John 10, 39 says this, Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. You see, you see, guys, they, the Jewish leaders, okay, this is what I'm talking about, they were seeking to capture him because they had already determined to kill him. And if that's the case, then if they could get their hands on those disciples, then guess what? They're going to pretty much do the same thing to, to, to them. So Jesus had eluded their attempts already once, and if he returned to Bethany, which is only a couple of miles from Jerusalem, where Lazarus and his family is, then those same religious knuckleheads, okay, are surely going to find out, and they're going to try to capture him again. Okay, the disciples knew what the problem was. They knew their angle, and they also knew that if they went back and they were after Jesus, then, like I just said, here comes the extra, uh, you know, the goon squad, if you will, from the religious leaders, and they're going to try to come after those disciples. Okay, so when Jesus said what he did in 11.4, this is John 11.4, the disciples had to have had a sigh of relief. And so let me just read that for us. Again, we're, we're, this is the, the prelude, okay, to the, to the raising of Lazarus. Verse 4 in chapter 11 says this, This sickness, he's talking to the disciples, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Okay, don't you, can't you just see the sigh of relief that, uh, that, that takes place over the faces of the disciples? Like, whew, whew, thank God. Well, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I, we don't have to go back. So they, there, there had to have been that, uh, that, that sense of calmness that just kind of swept over them. Um, you know, in all honesty, it, it was real close to party time. It was just, okay, we're done. We're it. We're staying. Okay. They can still avoid going all the way back to Jerusalem. It was calm. But then in John chapter 11, verse 7, just three verses later, Jesus pops her bubble. Okay. Verse 7. Let us go to Judea again. Now remember, he's talking to the disciples, okay? And so you've got to you got to know that they think Jesus is bipolar. I mean, he goes from this to this to this to this, and all of a sudden everything's fine. He's he's not dead. He's in the sickness. We're staying here. It's all good. He's going to get healed, and then all of a sudden, y'all y'all, our brother is dead. He's gone. Disciples had to have thought. It was the craziest thing ever. Verse 8, chapter 11, verse 8. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? In other words, Jesus, what are you thinking? You know what they tried to do. Why are you doing this? Why, why are you smoking, Jesus? I mean, come on. We, there's just no way. I mean, and, and if we're honest tonight, these guys did not want to go back. Not only because they knew what awaited them if the religious leaders found out and they come charging after them to take them and to seize them and to do whatever, uh, up to kill them, okay? 
But the ministry where they was, just like I said, the ministry right there was rocking and rolling. Everything was clicking. It was all good. So you've got on the one hand, you've got the ministry that's just like, wow. I, I mean, you see God all over it. And then all of a sudden you've got Jesus wanting to go back into, you know, what could be a, a probable stoning. So, I mean, it, it was just nuts. That was a definite time not to go back to Bethany. And those disciples knew it. So here in chapter 11, from verses 9 through 12, Jesus basically tries to calm down the disciples, okay? They, they didn't want to go back to die. He assured them they did not have nothing to fear. But at this point, you know, what are we doing, okay? Jesus, Jesus is trying to tell them, uh, when you get into verses 13 through 15, they understand the reality that Lazarus is indeed dead. And so when we get to the end of verse 11, the disciples understood now that they have to go back. All right, He was determined to do so, and there would be no talking him out of it. So they got this. In other words, Jesus had told them, look, guys, it's not what you think. He really has passed. He's dead. We've got to go back. And so to them, they're their worst possible fear was about to come true. They were scared to death. They were convinced that if Jesus went back to Bethany, that he would be killed. But Jesus had made up his mind. And it was at that point, right there, right there, that we get to meet Thomas, okay? So having said that, having set up this picture, we are back at verse 16. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, okay, Jesus already said, guys, we're going back. This is why, boom, boom, boom. He said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Okay, is this pessimist? Uh, is this a pessimistic statement? Absolutely, okay? It's typical for Thomas. But the thing I want you to see is it is almost a heroic pessimism that, that's screaming through here. Okay, you think about it. He could do nothing, okay, to change Jesus' mind. He could see nothing but disaster ahead. He was convinced. I mean, Thomas was convinced at this point that Jesus was headed straight for a stoning. But, and I love, I love this line. But if that is what the Lord was determined to do, then Thomas was grimly determined to go and to die with him. Now, folks, that's courage, okay? That's reality, and that's the Thomas that we have to see here because this is the Thomas that comes screaming off the pages of Scripture. It's not easy being a pessimist. It's honestly, it's a miserable life, okay? An optimist could have said, hey, let's go. Everything will work out. Jesus knows what he's doing. Boom, boom, boom. Okay? But the pessimist says, he's going to die, and we're going to die with him. Oh, woe is me. That was the viewpoint. And so when you think about it, Thomas at least had the courage to be loyal, even in the face of his pessimism. Didn't matter. It's easy for an optimist to be loyal he always expects the best. But it's hard for a pessimist to be loyal because he's always convinced that the worst is going to happen. So Thomas, the pessimist, he said this, let us, the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Guys, this was devotion. This was commitment. This was loyalty. I mean, you can't change anything at all about that. Thomas was very devoted to Christ. In fact, now I need you to hear this. In fact, he may have been the equal to John when it came to his level of devotion. And when we think about someone that, uh, you know, that was loved Jesus or was intimate with him, we almost always think of John. I mean, I, I've taught it for years. I've preached it for years. You've heard it. You've probably taught it yourself. So when we think of that, when we think of that, that one disciple that loved Jesus, was in with him, we automatically think of John. But it was crystal clear from right here in this passage that Thomas did not want to live without Jesus. 
I, he, he just didn't want to do it. If Jesus was going to die, then Thomas was prepared to die with him. He was like he was saying to the other disciples, guys, we got to suck it up. We go and die because it's better to die and be with Christ than to be left behind. And when you think about it, y'all, that's a show of strength. It's a show of loyalty, and it's a show of love for Jesus to the rest of the disciples. That, and, and here's why I need you to hear this. Because it must have moved the disciples so much because from our text here, there's nothing else that happens in this conversation between Jesus and the disciples because after what Thomas said, they must have said, okay, we're going to do this because they collectively followed Thomas's lead because they did go to Bethany. There was no conversation. There was no, what are you thinking? There was no, have you lost your mind? There was on their way to Bethany. And Thomas is the one who said that. Now that's convincibility. That's even talking to Simon Peter, the leader of the group. That's talking to his brother Andrew. That's talking to the sons of thunder, James and John. That's talking to Nathaniel. That's talking to Matthew. Okay. Guys, this is a leader talking here, but he's coming through a pessimistic viewpoint. Thomas had a deep devotion to Jesus that couldn't be dampened even by his own pessimism. I mean, you just think about that. He had no false illusion that following Jesus would be easy. All Thomas could see was that death was awaiting him and it was going to swallow him whole, but what? He follows him anyway. There was no questions. He was determined to die if necessary with Jesus rather than to forsake him and not be with him. He would rather die than to be left behind and separated from him. And so I want to ask us this question tonight. And this is something I just want you to chew on, okay? Just process this, okay? I said earlier that when we think of the scripture, when we think of that one disciple, that one disciple that we think of that loved Jesus the most, that was always there, that heard everything, boom, 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 okay? We think of John, okay? What if, what if, when we read scriptures and we read about, remember this line, the disciple whom Jesus loved? Was it Thomas instead of John? Okay? Just want you to think about it. Not trying to change your mind. Think about that. Okay? I've already told you. Where do we see all of Thomas at? In the book of John. Okay, something to think about. How does that change the dynamic of the disciples? Something to think about. Okay, so nothing more, just something to process. The next time you have a good stiff cup of coffee and you're reading, you're going to go, hmm, just something to think about. Thomas's deep love for Jesus shows up again in chapter 14. So uh, right now, I want you to flip on over. We're going to go to John 14. All right, get on over there. John 14. Okay, in John 14, we find this, this incredible passage of scripture where Jesus and his disciples, they're in the upper room. It's literally a couple of short hours away from when he's going to be arrested. They're in the garden. It's, it's literally the night before his crucifixion. And Jesus starts out this chapter. I, I love this chapter, by the way. He starts out this chapter telling his disciples of his imminent departure. It's Jesus. It's the disciples. It's quiet. And he has their undivided attention. Let's read John chapter 14, the first four verses. Okay, here we go. This is Jesus. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. We've heard this, okay? We, we, we get this. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. 
Okay. We find that passage of scripture, lots of sermons, lots of Sunday school texts, lots of conversations. We get it. We understand it. Jesus is telling the disciples what's about to happen. He's fixing to go away. Okay. In verse 5, the very next verse, we find Thomas again. Okay. Here's the pessimist. Let's look and see now what Thomas said in response to what Jesus just told him. Verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Okay? See the pessimism. See the pessimism. Basically, what, uh, you know, what our boy Thomas here was saying is like, you're leaving. We'll never get to where you're going. We don't even know how to get there. How are we supposed to get there? In, in other words, Jesus, it was a better plan back not too long ago that we could have died with you because there would not have been any separation. If we'd have died together, we'd have all been together. But if you go now, how in the world are we ever going to find you? We don't even know how to get there. Guys, this is a man with a deep, deep love for Jesus. Here is a man whose relationship with Jesus was so strong that he never wanted to be separate from him. Okay? And Thomas' heart was broken as he heard Jesus speak of leaving them. I mean, he was shattered. The loss of Jesus, the thought of losing Jesus paralyzed him. I mean, you just, you just process that for a minute. He had become so attached to Jesus in those years that he would have been glad to die with Jesus because he couldn't even think of living without him. Okay, church, we've got to acknowledge Thomas's love and devotion for Jesus Christ. And at this point, in all honesty, it trumps every uh, mental image we have as Thomas the doubter, okay? This was overwhelming for Thomas, and his worst fears came true just a few short hours later from this conversation because what happened? Jesus died, and Thomas didn't. I mean, Thomas is devastated. It's, it's just, it's bad. The next time we see Thomas, okay, from this point on, we know the story. We know what's going to go on. Jesus is, is going to continue his conversation. We know that he's going to dismiss Judas Iscariot into the night. We know that he's going to go and pray. We know he's going to be arrested, and we know the story of what takes place on the crucifixion, okay? We know that. We get that. So I want to fast forward through that. And then what I want to do is I want to take us now to John chapter 20, okay? John 20, so go ahead, go ahead and turn on over there. And the next time that we see, let's see, where am I at here? Here we go. The next time that we see Thomas is in chapter 20. Jesus is crucified. Jesus is, or he's gone, okay? Judas Iscariot is also gone too, all right? He's also gone. So now we have a total of 11 disciples, right? You with me on that? 11 disciples. Okay, look at verse 24. Now Thomas called the twin. Okay, we've identified him again. Thomas called the twin. One of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. So what had happened was, okay, Jesus comes in and he talks to the disciples, but Thomas is not there, okay? He's not there. He doesn't see it, okay? He's not with them. The other guys, the 10 other guys had, had locked themselves up in a room somewhere, most probably in the upper room in Jerusalem. If I look at verse 19, okay, this is chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, see, they're still scared that they're going to get attacked and get killed and get crucified the same way. Jesus came and stood in the midst, and he said to them, Peace be with you. So they're in this tight-knit space. Again, most probably, it is the upper room. The doors are shut. Here appears Jesus. And guys, the disciples are doing backflips. I mean, they are, they are ecstatic. Every one of them, except Thomas, was there. And he missed the whole thing. So I ask you tonight, where was Thomas? Where was Thomas? Why wasn't he there? Why was he not in this place? Okay, we focus on the, on the hereafter that's going to take place in this conversation. But I'm going to ask you right now, well, let's focus on, the, on what we know. 
We know that Thomas wasn't there. Why not? Is it possible? Now, I just I want you to just think about this, okay? We're looking at a man deeply devoted to Christ, very loyal to Christ. So, and we know he's a pessimist, okay? So is it possible, okay, that Thomas was so negative, so pessimistic, that he was absolutely destroyed, and that he was out somewhere off by himself, wallowing around in his own misery? I mean, guys, we got to remember, he could only see the worst of everything. And at this point, his worst fear had already come true. He had realized Jesus was gone. And here's Thomas, okay? Think about this. Jesus is gone. Thomas is thinking he's never going to see him again. And so Thomas just wanted to be all alone. He couldn't handle being with the rest of the disciples because they only reminded him more of the time that they had with Jesus. And it's even possible, stay with me, it's even possible that Thomas is sitting here thinking back to that John 14 passage, thinking that he would never find the way to get to where Jesus was, okay? See, I guarantee you, Thomas was no doubt regretting the fact that he didn't die with Jesus in the first place back when they headed back to Bethany to be with Lazarus' family, okay? Thomas may have felt, I mean, most probably did, he felt all alone, betrayed rejected, forsaken. I mean, to Thomas, it was over. The one he loved so deeply was gone and it was tearing his heart out. And he wasn't in the mood to socialize. He didn't want to be anywhere near anyone. He was brokenhearted. He was shattered. He was devastated. He just wanted to be alone, didn't want to be in that crowd. He didn't even want to be with his close friend. And then we pick back up here in verse 24, and we're going to read it again, and then we're going to head on into verse 25. At this point, when we get there, Thomas is now back with the 12 disciples. Verse 25 is going to tell us that. And they're telling him of their experience of seeing the risen Christ. These guys are just out of control excited, okay? They wanted to share that with their brother, Thomas. But someone in that mind frame, that mentality, that mood, if you will, that Thomas was in, he didn't want to have anything to do with it. And I can tell you right now, he wasn't about to be cheered up that easy. Do you have anybody that you know in your family, maybe somebody you work with that is this negative, that no matter what you say, no matter how static you are, there's that, oh, woe is me mentality, okay? I, I can assure you, I can start naming off names that fit this description, okay? He wasn't about to be cheered up that easy. He, there was no happy pill on the planet that was going to make him happy. So here we have Thomas, the hopeless pessimist. All he could see was the bad side of things. And what the disciples were about to tell him was almost too good to be true. So let's look at the response, okay? Verse 24, Thomas called the twin. One of the twelve was not with him when Jesus came. Verse 25, the other disciples therefore said to him, said to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. So he, Thomas, he said to them, guys, unless I see in his hands, the print of the nails, and I put my finger into the print of the nails, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And it's here, it's this verse, this verse alone, that we get that nickname of Doubting Thomas. It's real easy to be extremely hard on Thomas at this point. I get it, okay? I get it. But something we may miss in this uh, dissection of character studies, if we read Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 13, we're going to find that the other disciples didn't believe in the resurrection either until they saw Jesus. So flip back over with me. We're going to go to Mark chapter 16, real quick. Mark chapter 16, and I'm going to pick this up at verse number 9. Okay, you guys with me? Mark 16, starting at verse number 9. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him about the disciples, as they mourned and wept, and when they heard that he was alive 
and had been seen by her, they, what? They did not believe. Look at verse 12. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not, what? Believe them either. Okay. So it's not just doubting tongues, okay? We got the whole slew of them now that are just not wanting to believe. And so I want to go back now to our original text in John 20, and I want to get the rest of the story. Okay, John 20, we're going to pick up 26, 27, and 28. Okay, here we go. He's already told him, Thomas has already told him, guys, unless I see the hands, unless I can put my hand in his side, okay, I will not believe. Verse 26, chapter 20, John's gospel. And after eight days, in other words, eight days later, all right, eight days later, his disciples were again inside. So they're back in the same room, okay, this upper room. And Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and he stood in the midst and he said, peace to you. Look at verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, Jesus is in a room with 11 disciples. And now he looks directly at Thomas. And he says this, reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but Believing. Reach right here. Put your finger right here. Look at my hands. Okay. See my hands. Reach your hand over here. Put it in my side. You see the gentleness of Jesus as he's talking to Thomas. He's so loving. This is not a critical statement. This is a loving statement. You see, Thomas had stumbled only because he was wired as a pessimist. But it was the error of a very profound love. It was provoked by grief. It was provoked by brokenheartedness, uncertainty. And it was provoked by the pain of loneliness. Guys, no one, no one could feel the way Thomas felt unless he loved Jesus the way that Thomas loved Jesus. Okay, I, need, I just need you to hear that. The greatest statement that could ever come out of Thomas's mouth is found in verse 28. Jesus had just said that. He says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. Verse 28. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. At that moment, Thomas's comfortless, negative, pessimistic, even moody tendencies were forever banished by the appearance of Jesus Christ. And so Thomas, our doubting Thomas, let it be known that he was a man forever in love with Jesus Christ. I... Uh, uh, with your permission, I'd like to close tonight with another one of those devotions like I did last week that I wrote several years ago. Here's our devotion. Everywhere he looked, the crowds were gathering and making their way up the mountain. One of my favorite pastimes is people watching. It's so much fun to be in crowds of people and watch their habits, their actions, hear their statements, and to see the truth. There are two days of the year that could be termed the holy grail of people watching. The day after Thanksgiving and Christmas Eve. On these two days, the inner self, or should I say the inner beast, can always be seen. 
From the sweetest little grandma to the dirtiest old man, one's true self is always on center stage for all the world to see for these two days. My annual ritual for these specific days are to be up early, up in a shopping mall with at least a five-shot latte in hand and another one brewing, to find a safe place, if possible, to be totally out of the way from all the shoving and the snatching, and just observe. It's absolutely amazing what I've seen during these times over the years. And with each year, it brings a different twist. Each year, it seems, there is always this one item that industry analysts always determine it is the must-have item on everyone's list. And it never fails that there is always a shortage of the gift, which is in turn releases the demons of the people. I have seen fine, upstanding citizens, or so I thought, church deacons by title only, church leaders, or so they thought, and countless others become barbaric in their actions and savages in their speech when faced with the thought of not being able to get one of those specific year's blockbuster items. This year, thousands will gather outside their favorite stores in hopes that waiting until the last minute will pay off. Hours before the turkey has settled from the Thanksgiving meal and hours before Santa has hitched the reindeer up to his sleigh. This year's projected hot item, TMX Elmo. One article reads this. The much-anticipated top-secret 10th anniversary Elmo, codenamed TMX Elmo, is finally here. Fisher-Price, a division of number one toy maker Mattel, unveiled the new TMX Elmo to the world on Tuesday. Elmo fans could face a shortage of the new TMX Elmo over the holidays. Elmo fans should grab the new toy while they can, because industry analysts are already anticipating a shortage of Elmo TMX over the holiday season. I can just see it now. A WWF SmackDown is taking place in toy aisle number four, while just one aisle over is an imitation of a Jerry Springer-like production entitled, I'll Give You an Elmo. And meanwhile, over the PA system, a nasally female's voice attempts to rise above the ruckus and the screams. Would the little old lady please put the wig back on the bald man? And would the lady in the cowboy boots kindly remove her foot from Mrs. So-and-so's... We won't go there. Yeah, this is going to be a good year. And even though this scenario will play out in malls across America... And even though as humorous as it will be, this type of foolishness saddens me. We have allowed ourselves to become materialized to the point that we will go hours out of our way to stand in line for hours in order to attempt to purchase an item that probably will be sold out by the time we get to the counter. We march in masses of mortal mayhem attempting to convince ourselves this type of behavior is acceptable. What's wrong with this picture? Scripture tells us of other multitudes, countless masses of people seeking a savior, searching, grasping, hoping. Now, it's 2,000 years later, and we're involved in a new multitude, and we're still searching, grasping, and hoping. The first crowd was in search of a man called Jesus, the giver of hope, the giver of grace. I'm afraid that we're involved in a multitude that is quite possibly seeking a giver of giggles that will only last till the batteries wear out. Thank you for hanging out with me tonight. It is Wednesday on Tuesday, the week of Thanksgiving. Join me tomorrow morning, if you can, uh, for our last coffee chat of the week, somewhere between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. I'd love to have you. And then I will see you folks, Lord willing, Sunday morning, 9.30 is Sunday school, 10.15 is our digital lobby, and then at 10.30, our worship time will start, and we are going to continue in our 30 days of Thanksgiving series. If I do not see you guys on the line tomorrow morning, please, please, please have a fabulous, fabulous Thanksgiving. Spend quality time with your family. Let that be the thrust, and always remember to give thanks.
for every single solitary thing. I love you guys tremendously. Be safe. Be safe. And be safe. I love you guys tons. Good night. We'll talk soon.